friends. Here is a very, very interesting and important poem from American literature. Allen Ginsberg's poem, America. You might probably know that Ginsberg belonged to the Beat Generation. The Beat Generation was a literary and counterculture movement of the 1950s. Well, counterculture was a term that came after the 50s, in the 60s and 70s. The Beat Generation was a prototypically counterculture movement. Initially, the Beats were associated with New York in the East, and then they moved to San Francisco in California in the West. The Beat Generation gained popularity with the members who joined it together and met in the coffee houses and colleges of San Francisco. They started public reading and eventually they became associated with Lawrence Ferlinghetti's City Lights Bookstore. It was Lawrence Ferlinghetti who published Allen Ginsberg's major book, Howl and Other Poems, in which our poem, America, was also published. The Beat Generation had tremendous influence in America as well as in Europe, and they became like cultural icons in post-war America. The Beat Generation questioned the rampant materialism and rising corporatism in America. America was becoming a world power and leading the world in corporate capitalism at this time. And the Beat Generation rebelled against this consumerist culture. They expressed a dissatisfaction with American culture and saw capitalism as destructive to the human spirit and antithetical to social equality. The Beat Generation were also against sexual repression. They rejected the taboos in American society that existed against sexuality. And they understood that these taboos are unhealthy. They advocated free speech, free love, legalized prostitution and legalized drug use. Absolute freedom of the individual. They expressed their ideas through literature. Literature was seen as bold, straightforward, and expressive. As you will see in this poem, the language becomes expressive of their rebellion, expressive of their indignation and unrest. Literature took on new levels of expression in the hands of the Beat Generation writers. They were very provocative and unconventional. And some critics dismissed their literature as indecent, as not even literature. Because it was so provocative and deliberately vulgar. Who are the beat writers? I'm sure most of you will know some of them. For example, Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. They were the founders of the Beat Generation, Jack Kerouac and Alan Ginsberg. They were friends, and they met in Columbia University in the early 1940s. Within a decade, they had become the cultural icons of post-war America. It seems it was Kerouac who coined the term Beat Generation. The other members of the Beat Generation were Lucy and Carr, John Clellan Holmes, Gregory Corso, Neil Cassidy. Neil Cassidy is famous because he and Jack Kerouac together traveled, and Jack Kerouac's On the Road was the result. That was the book. William S. Burroughs, he was not a main Beat Generation writer, 
but he was associated with them and he was like the godfather of the cultural countercultural movements of the 1960s punk and so on what are the characteristic features of the beat generation the beat generation is also called beatniks what characterized their literature and culture let us take a look there were from the educated middle class the beat generation writers were all from the educated middle class and they turned against middle class they used their education for rebellion they were anti establishment and anti academy they were they were against the established mainstream conventions of culture they were associated with the romantic surrealist and absurdist movements in literature they deliberately employed to express their rebellion and spiritual quest to express the alternate conditions of human life they employed romantic surrealist and absurdist tendencies the beatniks admired thoreau and his walden thoreau was a rebel he questioned the establishment he stood against the nation and its government and they admired thoreau's liberal ideas they rejected the objective and formalist modernism of t s eliot t s eliot was too elite for them even though t s eliot was also spiritual in his writing even though t s eliot also explored eastern uh, religions and cultures and philosophies the beatniks rejected his formal modernism in favor of experimentation not only with literature not only not in the style of t s eliot in a different style in a very rebellious and uh, disturbing vulgar style t s eliot never used such vulgarity the poet publisher lawrence ferlinghetti who ran the city lights bookstore in san francisco in california was their patron and city lights was their hub of activities uh i did not mention one thing i will mention eventually the beat generation writers experimented with psychedelic drugs because as i told you they believed in free drug use and they also experimented with homosexuality because they believed in sexual liberation allen ginsberg was definitely the most important um of the beat generation writers he was a bohemian a nonconformist poet lived from 1926 to 1997 allen ginsberg was born into a jewish family uh in newark in new jersey ginsberg became the icon uh of the 1950s the 1950s was a time when jews were dominating america in literature and thought and in all walks of life there were the jewish american novelists also like saul bellow who emerged in the 1950s uh ginsberg was born into a jewish family in newark near the place called patterson and he vigorously opposed militarism america after the second world war was entering more and more into a militaristic uh, relationship with other nations eventually after this after the beat generation the vietnam war would also become the most notorious and controversial political uh, militaristic engagement of america so there was the cold war happening at this time after the second world war there was a threat of nuclear disaster once again and ginsberg like many others at this time vigorously oppo- opposed militarism economic materialism or capitalism and sexual repression 
He took part in non-violent political protests. He was an activist and he took part in non-violent political protests uh, in and around New York. In 1948, in an apartment in Harlem, he had the Blake vision. The concept of vision was related to uh, W.B. Yeats's mystic vision and uh, vision also was related for the Beats to a new era in literature and politics in America. So vision was a large term for them and he had the Blake vision. That means for several days he heard the voice of William Blake reading his own poems. And uh, Ginsburg had political and literary connections in India. He traveled in India. That was after the publication of Howell. And uh, he got involved in Indian uh, philosophy and spirituality. Uh, he got acquainted with the Hare Krishna cult. So all these were very mystic experiences that uh, was associated with Ginsburg. It was uh, at this time that he moved to San Francisco from New York. And uh, that was where he met our Rolf, uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti and uh, the, the, the beat generation became very prominent at this time. So, and then he later on lived in Paris and London and he became a practicing Buddhist. As I told you, he also embraced the, Krishnaism at this time and chanted Hare Krishna mantra in his performances because it had a very great spiritual significance for him. Uh, it was a big surprise for the literary world when immediately after the publication of Howell and its obscenity trial, Ginsburg uh, abandoned San Francisco. Uh, before he settled down in Paris, he had uh, lived for a brief time in uh, Morocco. And uh, it was after this that he traveled extensively across India. He met a lot of Indian writers and uh, even politicians. And uh, his friendships with Indians gave him a very strong spiritual foundation. So uh, that was, in a nutshell, his spiritual conquests and after that his health failed due to hectic schedule he was traveling too much and he was uh, performing his poetry too much and uh, it was like in the 1960s uh, that he his health began to fail in the 1970s he suffered from uh, strokes and uh, it affected his health very seriously um, and uh, he had many stress related uh, body disorders and it was in the 1990s in April that he finally died in Manhattan. By that time he had become uh, you know an unparalleled celebrity in America. For Allen Ginsberg poetry was a catalyst to visionary states of mind. Uh, I'm somewhat reminded of Aurobindo. Um, for Ginsberg, poetry is a medium to transport him to visionary experiences, spiritual experiences. He was committed in presenting the discontinuities of consciousness. He presented that in his uh, poetry in the form of themes as well as uh, language the discontinuities of consciousness. Let us take a quick look at Allen Ginsberg's <clears throat> major works. Kaddish, after Howell and America came Kaddish in 1961. It is an account of personal grief. Love poem on a theme by Whitman that came earlier 1956. It is about a passionate sexual encounter. And the reply is an experience of drugs that he has recounted. Don't Grow Old is about the death of his father. Uh, many of his important poems are also included in 
the collection Howl and Other Poems that came in 1956. Howl is definitely his magnum opus. It's his most important poem, and it was a turning point in the history of American literature, the publication of Howl. Before it was published, there was a public reading in the Sixth Gallery in San Francisco in October 1955. After the public reading, the first publication happened in 1956. The publisher was Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and it was followed by a notorious obscenity trial. The book was printed in London, and it was seized at the customs itself, and it was immediately put under trial, which Ginsburg won. That was a landmark trial. Uh, the po poem Howl, like the poem America, appeared in Howl and other poems. Other important poems are Sunflower Sutra, a supermarket in California, etc. All these poems are prescribed in various universities. The opening line of Howl is very, very famous. It is important that you should know it. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness starving, hysterical, naked. This is a breath length line. You are supposed to hold your breath and the pronunciation, the, the reading of the line should end with your breath. <laughs> and um, this line is applicable to our poem America as well. In America also, he presents more or less the same theme. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, the madness of politics, the madness of war, the madness of repression. He is retaliating against such madness in the poem America as well. In uh, Howl as well as America, he has used long lines based on breath. As I told you, it's called breath length form, intended to be read aloud almost chanted. Many of the uh, words and the linguistic peculiarities, the stylistic peculiarities of the poem can be um, understood only when it is read aloud. It's very important. This denotes a return to the oral tradition in poetry which had been long neglected from the written to the oral. And the poem is written without restrictions. Both Howell and uh, America are written without restrictions in a tumbling, hallucinatory style. Sometimes in both these poems, you wonder whether he is in his right mind. And Howell, as well as America, employ a syntactic subversion of meaning, a subversion of meaning called parataxis. Remember, all these are key words, breath length form, parataxis. Please remember to use such words when you write about Allen Ginsberg. In both these poems, you will also see a frank, fearless treatment of sexuality, especially homosexuality, leading to an obscenity trial, which Ginsberg <coughs> won. Now let me tell you an introduction to the poem America which is the poem we are discussing today. It's a radical political poem depicting the poet's or the speaker's argument with post-Second World War America. The poem is written like an argument that the poet is having with America in the post-World War period. And what are they arguing about? They are talking about the political unrest in the nation. A lot of decisions that America took at this time, a lot of uh, things that happened in America and abroad led to political unrest in the nation. This unrest was only going to increase in the coming decade, the 1960s. Well, America is about that. If you want to know what are the reasons for the political unrest, here are a few, I have left, listed them out. One is the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
at the uh, end of the Second World War, America bombed these two cities and that is how the war ended. Then there was the McCarthy and Communist witch hunt led by Senator Joseph McCarthy under the presidentship of Eisenhower. The Dwight Eisenhower was the president of America at this time. He kept quiet and Joseph Se uh, McCarthy, the senator, hunted down the communists, put, uh, put them under trial and without trial also many of them were punished. Another mad situation was created by the Cold War. The Cold War between the USA and the USSR and the ensuing nuclear threat. Both of them, both these countries had hoarded nuclear weapons that would destroy the earth many times over. And people lived in constant fear that another world war would result. There was also the Asian foreign policy that was leading to many disastrous consequences. While America and the uh, USSR were engaged in Cold War, many ha things were happening in uh, Asia, especially in Ch China, and Americans were worried. At this time, there was the corporate capitalism that was on the rise, and a lot of minority groups, like the African Americans, women, the Chicano Americans, etc., uh, started to protest. There was African American unrest. Uh, there was many. There were many civil rights movements. But as part of the civil rights movements, a lot of minorities were repressed. At large, there was sexual and spiritual repression against all this. Uh, Ginsburg is raging in this poem, and all this caused political unrest in the nation. The poem was written in 1956 on the 17th of January in Berkeley, California. And it was included in Howl and other poems. It has a non-conformist beat tone. <laughs> I, that is non-conformist, I have repeated. That is highly provocative. Yeah, it has a non-conformist uh, beat tone that is highly provocative. It is meant to make America angry. And the poem uses irregular stanzas without proper punctuation. It is even difficult to find out what is the exact stanzaic form. What, where are the stanzas ending? because in different websites, different books, it is appearing in different ways. <laughs> Irregular stanzas. The poet or the speaker is angry with the nation, with the politics of the government. He is disagreeing with it. And he is uh, trying to show us the mess that America is. The poem is rich with political, cultural, and autobiographical references. And he is raising his voice against injustices. And that voice becomes the voice of the downtrodden. Remember, your voice is part of the nation that you belong to. But is it really heard? If you speak, does the nation listen to it? If you disagree with the government, can you do anything about it? That question is there in this poem. See, our poet, the speaker, wants to be heard because he realizes that he is part of the nation. He has a responsibility. This is something he shares with Thoreau uh, and Walt Whitman, two earlier writers whom he admired. And why he wants his voice to be heard is because he cares about his nation and he cares about the world. Now we are going into the poem proper. America, I've given you all, and now I'm nothing. America, two hundred. America, two dollars and twenty-seven cents, January 17, nineteen fifty-six. 
can't stand my own mind. America, when will we end the human war? Go fuck yourself with your atom bomb. I don't feel good, don't bother me. I don't write my poem till I'm in my right mind. <laughs> this is the beginning. It sounds like a man who is greatly troubled and neurotic has given America everything he had and now he is le he's left with nothing. The day that he wrote this poem is the day that he has given America everything he says. And he is frustrated. He wants America to stop the human war. And he's using an expletive and getting angry with America because of its use of the atom bomb. Let us look at this section in detail. America, I've given you all and now I'm nothing. America, $2.27, January 17, 1956. Can't stand my own mind. It's like a man talking to himself. America is personified. And obviously he's carrying on a conversation with it. He must have felt intimacy with America, perhaps like a lover. You can't say a female lover because he never addresses America as a woman. Could be a man. Suggestion of homosexuality. He must have felt intimacy with America, perhaps like a lover and dead. And he's very unhappy with that lover. And probably that's why he gave it all. And then he feels he is betrayed. He's let down by his nation. The mood of hopelessness and protest is evoked right at the beginning. This part therefore functions like an introduction to the poem. You know right away what's happening. He's unhappy with America. He feels betrayed by America and he's going out of his mind and he's feeling disgusted. All that is conveyed here. $2.27 is a small amount of money even in 1956. <laughs> but that would be, that is all he has, he says. And that would certainly be valuable for really poor people. America, even though it pretends to be a rich country, there are lots of very poor people in America, homeless people, people without any money, like the speaker. The speaker identifies with them. The speaker clearly says he's not a rich man, for $2.27 is all that he had. And he's financially as well as emotionally let down by his nation. America did not let him make more money. And America has taken everything and he's left emotionally drained. And this date is important for him. That's why he's telling the date as part of the poem. Cramming it together with the detail of the exact amount. The exact amount and date all crammed it together without punctuation. It shows that ordinary people like him suffer at that time. They remember that date on which they were betrayed because they can't afford it. And these are also times of cultural poverty. He is unhappy with American culture also, as we'll increasingly realize in the rest of the poem. He is unable to be at ease with himself in such a culturally impoverished, horrible country. That's why probably he says, I can't stand my own mind. Now, as well as later, in the way he talks, as well as later, we realize that probably he's not in his right mind. He's disgusted with his mind, with himself, as well as with the nation. America, when will we end the human war? Go fuck yourself with your atom bomb. Very straightforward. There is no mincing the meat here. Now we know why he is so dejected. He doesn't like the war. He asks a question point blank. Perhaps that question which had been bothering him most. It is not a very easy question to ask and this question is probably eating his head. What is that question? When will we end the human war? This war that America is waging seems to be like forever. Are you going to end it? When are you going to end it? 
He's tired of this meaningless war. The Second World War ended, but that doesn't mean war ended. It's going on. America is still preparing for war and also fighting with other countries, meaninglessly. He's tired. And perhaps he feels partly responsible for the war because he's also an American. He's part of the nation. It is, a res it is his responsibility to ask America to stop the war. That's why he says, when will we end the war? America, when will you end the war? That's not what he asked. When will we end the war? He's not shirking his responsibility. And he says, human war. Why does he say human war? To highlight the massive, absurd destruction it has caused to humanity. That word human is very painful. Many human beings have died and humanity or humaneness, human values have died. It points to how inhuman it is. He means, of course, America is dropping an atom bomb on Hiroshima on 6th August 1945 and three days later on Nagasaki, thus ending the Second World War but beginning an era of even more horrendous destruction. That the speaker considers the war absurd is completely Sorry, and completely pointless. He considers the war to be absurd. He considers the war to be completely pointless. That he does not respect America because of its involvement in the war. He doesn't feel proud that his country is leading in killing people. Even if it's your own country, if the country seeks war, that is not something to be proud of. It is clear from the expression, go fuck yourself. The use of the expletive adds to the disgust that he feels. He's, he can't speak any more politely. It's affecting him, even personally, we know. And perhaps he's justified in his indignation. It's okay, let the government do what they want. I'm not concerned. He can't think like that. He is concerned. He is affected. It is his guilt too. Just before he wrote this poem, uh, within a year before this, he was under psychiatric treatment for feelings of dejection and guilt, Ginsburg. The repetition of the word America, 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 he's calling and speaking, it's anaphora, Repetition of an expression in subsequent uh, lines in poetry is called anaphora. It perhaps indicates that America is not listening to him. He has to call America repeatedly. America, I've given you all. America, $2.27. America, when will we end the war? You know? It also shows that he's being irritating, provocative, and fearless. He's trying to provoke America into replying. He wouldn't let America be, you know? I don't feel good, don't bother me. I don't write my poem till I'm in my right mind. These are the next two lines. He realizes that his conversation itself is pointless. This conversation is pointless. He doesn't want to carry on with this conversation. He wants it to end even before he has begun. I don't feel good, don't bother me. He started the conversation and then he's asking America to stop bothering him. The intensity of his trauma and the urgency of his need to end the conversation is seen in the two sentences being crammed together in one line without a punctuation. I don't feel good, don't bother me. The conversation is truly taking the feel of two people who live together and one of them feeling bothered by the other. He's trapped in that relationship. He can't escape. And he's fighting. He seems to have no easy escape from America. The memory of the insane bombing is what suddenly made him want to end this conversation. 
That is what made the meaningful conversation impossible for him. After America has done what it has done, nothing can be said. God has died and we have killed him. You know, there is no more conversation possible with this murderer. And Ginsburg, the speaker, is sensitive, hurt by America's inconsiderate actions. We also get the sense of a neurotic, perhaps insane man. From the way he talks, as well as from his own suggestion that he's not in his right mind. I won't write my poem till I'm in my right mind. And he's not in his right mind. Will he ever be in his right mind? Will he ever write this poem? We wonder. Because America is what has driven him mad. We realize that America doesn't really care about him. America doesn't care about anyone. It looks like that. And is probably not even listening to him. That's why he has to call America repeatedly. And the irony is that even though he says, I won't write my poem till I'm in my right mind, he goes on writing the poem. Many, many more lines are yet to come. So let me just go back and, uh, wait, I didn't read that section. Let me read it again for you. Ta -da! The section that we just discussed. America, I've given you all and now I'm nothing. America, $2.27, January 17, 1956. Can't stand my own mind. America, when will we end the human war? <laughs> Go fuck yourself with your atom bomb. I don't feel good, don't bother me. I won't write my poem till I'm in my right mind. <sighs> Already it's depressing, eh? And now the next part. It's not really a part, it's a continuation. America, when will you be angelic? When will you take off your clothes? When will you look at yourself through the grave? When will you be worthy of your million Trotskyites? America, why are your libraries full of tears? America, when will you send your eggs to India? <laughs> I'm sick of your insane demands. When can I go into the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? He's really being irritating, asking so many questions. He is the one who looks like insane and he's the one who's making demands, but he feels he has the right to do it because America has behaved even worse. I'm sick of your insane demands, he says. And he's, in every question he's reminding America of all that America has done, irrecoverably, of all that America has destroyed. Let us take a detailed view. America, when will you be angelic? When will you take off your clothes? See, he's being cheeky and provocative. The speaker presumably had high hopes in his nation and wants to see America pure and angelic, but America is not angelic now. America, when will you be angelic? Will you ever be angelic again? <laughs> that America will be angelic is of course an impossibility because there are so many million people, millions of people in America. How can they all together become angelic? It is an impossibility. And it only highlights the corruption and inhumanity of the nation. See, he is questioning the very concept of a state. That is an anarchist stand. He is questioning the very necessity of a state. That is called anarchism. And uh, far from being angelic, America has caused death and destruction. That is what he is reminding us. These lines are a scathing criticism of consumerism and capitalism in America. You know, 
the consumerist capitalist America had a very big industry, Hollywood, where women were constantly taking off clothes at this time. We had sex divas like Marilyn Monroe. And uh, this also suggests homosexuality. Throughout the poem, he suggests homosexuality as well. Metaphorically, these lines also mean that America is on the verge of ruin. The speaker clearly is anxious for his nation to be great again. Angelic is something that human beings cannot be. America is going to be destroyed probably by its own actions. He's anxious that America should be great again. If America will ever appear to him as pure and angelic, then his desire in her or him may again be rekindled. If he ever sees America as angelic, he would want America. He would want to live there. He would have desire for him or her. But America is not desirable now. He kind of hates America. Because America is not what he wants to be, wants America to be. And America perhaps appears rigid and even dead, as the next line will suggest. When will you look at yourself through the grave? When will you be worthy of your million Trotskyites? <laughs> the depressive mood of the speaker is turning morbid and angry. Is America dead in spirit that it has to look at itself through the grave? Or is Ginsburg reminding America of its mortality? Or in other words, that the glory it seems to have now is ephemeral. America, you are not going to be a glorious nation forever. Look at yourself. You are dying. You're at the point of ruin. The glory that you seem to bask in is ephemeral. It's not there forever. There are a million tr communists or Trotskyites in America, he says. More than America ever imagined. America at this time is at war with them. There is the McCarthyan witch hunt, as I told you. It is not easy to destroy one million Trotskyites. And they are wonderful people. America, when will you be worthy of them? Because America thinks the Trotskyites are the enemies and they are evil, but actually America does not realize that America itself is more oppressive and narrow-minded than it thinks the communists are. The worst thing here is America itself, not communism. Ginsburg subtly asserts that communism will only do America good. Well, to speak like this provocatively was dangerous in those days. He would be arrested, probably punished, but he's risking it. As a young man, Ginsburg was influenced by his mother, Naomi. Naomi Ginsburg was his mother. She had communist leanings. She was a communist activist. And Ginsburg wanted to help the working classes as a lawyer but he ended up as a poet. So he is connected with communism. He has a deep regard for the communists. America, why are you libraries? I found 11 matching contacts. Could you be more specific? <laughs> My Siri is thinking and talking to him. Okay. Interesting question. Oh, shut up. Okay. America, let me just silence my phone. Yeah. America, why are your libraries full of tears? America, when will you send your eggs to India? What does that mean? America, why are your libraries full of tears? Libraries stand for liberal free thinking, isn't it? Books, libraries, stand for equality and objectivity. The libraries are personified. 
and they are now full of tears. The libraries are lamenting the end of free thinking in the country. Or perhaps he means that people are not interested in knowledge and wisdom anymore. There's a lot of corruption in American society. People are not interested in knowledge and wisdom and libraries are crying. Or perhaps people go to the libraries to take refuge from the oppressive era but find no solace in contemporary thinking. So the libraries are full of the tears of the readers. It has many meanings. Anyway, think, thought, thinking, and the era do not match. In India, there was a famine at this time, Bengal famine in 1943. About a decade before this poem was written, and it is said that three million people died of starvation. <laughs> While Americans were living, not the poor Americans, but the wealthy Americans. America was making more money from international relations. And what did America do to help India? You know, why isn't America helping the starving and suffering people around the world? That is the question that Ginsburg is raising. Now, I'm sick of your insane demands. When can I go to the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? Look at what he's saying. How can you go to a supermarket and buy what you need with good looks? Well, in America, good looks dominated at this time. Let's see how. America wants its people to stand by and appreciate its injustices and insane actions. That's what every nation, every government would say. If you criticize the government, you will be branded an anti-national. It happens everywhere. The speaker cannot bring himself to support any of the injustices and insane actions of America. He's critical of every aspect of contemporary politics. And he's asserting his right to raise his voice against it. He will not be quiet. He's sick of America's insane demands of its citizens. Sarcastically, he's himself making an insane demand next. <coughs> he wants to go to the supermarket and buy what he needs with his good looks. Now, how is that possible? That is insane, isn't it? The speaker means that America is a surface culture. The speaker is lashing out against a hypocritical, consumerist, showbiz culture here. The 1950s was a time of Hollywood icons like Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley, who dominated the industry by their good looks. They also dominated the fashion and cosmetic industries, not only the Hollywood industry. When people are starving in and out of post-war America, within America, outside America, everywhere people are starving in this post-war era. At that time, all that mattered to many people in America is surface appearance and insane spending of wealth. What can be called consumerism? Consumerism, the word, was not in use in those days, yes, but... Consumerism is what happened in those days. So he's attacking consumerism. He's attacking America's surface culture. And now the next section of the poem. America, after all, it's you and I who are perfect, not the next world. <laughs> Your missionary is too much for me. You made me want to be a saint. There must be some other way to settle this argument. Burroughs is in Tangiers. I don't think he'll come back. It's sinister. Are you being sinister? Or is it some form of practical joke? I'm trying to come to the point. I refuse to give up my obsession. America, stop pushing. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> what is he saying? This is a stream of consciousness. America, after all, it's you and I who are perfect, not the next world. Your missionary is too much for me. 
America always thought of itself as powerful and perfect. Earlier, we have the American dream, which of course failed. America always thought that it is the paragon of freedom and prosperity. It is the land of the free. It is the land of prosperity. That is how America projected its own image. And America thought of itself as superior to all nations of the world. <laughs> and Ginsburg is laughing at America's notions of perfection, grandiose notions of perfection. America, after all, it's you and I who are perfect, not the next world. <laughs> He's saying, the speaker is sarcastically saying that only America and himself are perfect. Well, we know that he is far from perfect already because of the way he speaks. Of course, what he means is it's opposite. Neither of them is perfect. The next world is also not perfect. The next world is what comes after death. In this dying culture of America, the future is the next world probably. The mention of the next world once again reminds us that he's that he fears his nation is on the verge of ruin. He's afraid that the nation is on the verge of ruin. He's warning his nation not to take the future for granted. Machinery probably refers to the way politics and economics work in America. The speaker has serious objections to the politics of America. The speaker does not think America is doing the right thing in politics. He is also objecting to corporate capitalism that was gaining more and more power in those days. He's against the corporatism and the politics both. You, may we, you made me want to be a saint. There must be some other way to settle this argument. What does that mean? America gave its citizens the dream of freedom and prosperity, right? America taught its citizens it is possible to be wealthy. It is possible to be free. Money will give you freedom. Everyone believed it and wanted to be rich and free, to live their lives the way they want. <laughs> the American dream turned into a nightmare. All this was not true. The speaker feels quite the opposite. He is disgusted with the materialism and wastefulness of American culture. He sees through it. The materialism and wastefulness of American culture made him more spiritual and ascetic. He wants to be a saint now. <laughs> Think of the great Gatsby. The excesses of the American wealthy people you can see there. The speaker feels that the differences that he has with his country are so deep rooted that this argument may go on and on unresolved. There might be no meeting point between him and the nation. So he wonders if there is some way to resolve the argument and reconcile with his country. Actually, this is the only time he attempts to reconcile. After that, he starts to quarrel. Burroughs is in Tangiers. I don't think he'll come back. It's sinister. <laughs> Are you being sinister? Or is this some form of practical joke? Now, that is a, an autobiographical reference. William S. Burroughs was Ginsburg's friend. He lived from 1914 to 1997. He was an exceptionally talented beat writer and friend of Ginsburg. He's called the grandfather of punk. And you know what he did? He controversially advocated drugs culture. He advocated the use of drugs. And he wrote books about it like Junkie. He had an anarchic stance in culture, rejecting values and state. And you know what he did? He murdered his wife during a drunken game, a William Tell game. What is a William Tell game? William Tell is a legendary person who was asked to shoot an apple on his son's head. Shooting an apple on someone's head is called William Tell game. And Burroughs was drunk. 
and he shot the apple and his wife died. After that, he lived in exile in Tangier in Morocco, where drugs were freely available. Barroso is in Tangiers. I don't think he'll come back. It's sinister. You know what it means. Ginsburg strongly advocated legalization of drugs. Let people use drugs if they want it. Only very intelligent and genius people use drugs. It is human right. This is what he thought. Without legalization of drugs, he thought America will lose the best minds of his generation. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving hysterical naked. Remember? America has lost Barrows anyway. He's not going to return. America will lose more and more best minds if drugs are not legalized. The 1950s and 60s were the time when drugs culture existed in America because of the influence of Mexico, Morocco, etc. Is America being sinister by destroying its best minds? Or is it a kind of William Tell game or practical joke? Like Barrows destroyed his wife without wanting it. Is America accidentally killing off or destroying its best minds? He's asking, is this a practical joke or is America really being sinister? I'm trying to come to the point. I refuse to give up my obsession. I'm trying to come to the point. We are, America is thinking, America is asking him, what are you trying to say? And he says, I'm trying to come to the point. And he says, point blank, straightforward. I refuse to give up my obsession. America, stop pushing. I know what I'm doing. You know, like a lover telling a partner. This man, the speaker, is rambling and deliberately evoking a drunken or drugged tone. I don't know if he's really drunken. He's just evoking that tone as a kind of protest or challenge to the nation. And the nation, on the contrary, is putting on a pretense of sanity and rationality to justify its insanely atrocious actions. Actually, the nation is insane. The nation is doing atrocious actions and it is pretending sanity and rationality. Here, the speaker is apparently insane or drunken, but what he is saying is what is sane. He is stating his point, or what he wants to assert is this. What is that? He will, which is that he'll never give up his obsession. And what is his obsession? His obsession is to reform America, to change the evil mess that America has got itself into. America is pushing him to stop and forcing him to change. America is pushing him to give up his unconventional ideas and lifestyle. America doesn't want him to be so critical, <laughs> but he's not going to change because he knows what he's doing. America, stop pushing. I know what I'm doing. He's sure of himself. He knows what he's doing and he will not change. The two sentences crammed into one line, America, stop pushing. I know what I'm doing, shows his impatience with America, as well as his confidence in what he's doing. He doesn't take time to say it. He knows it. And then the next part of the poem. America, the plum blossoms are falling. I haven't read the newspaper for months. Everybody, somebody goes on trial for murder. Every day, somebody goes on trial for murder. America, I feel sentimental about the war police. America, I used to be a communist when I was a kid. I'm not sorry. I spoke marijuana every chance I get. I sit in my house for days on end and stare at the roses in the closet. When I go to Chinatown, I get drunk and never get laid. My mind is made up. There's going to be trouble. You should have seen me reading Marx. Let us check it out. America, the plum blossoms are falling. 
I haven't read the newspapers for months. Every day somebody goes on trial for murder. Plum blossoms are an important aspect of Chinese culture. Plum blossoms, they're beautiful. They symbolize hope and peace. When the speaker suddenly brings in plum blossoms, he's actually suggesting that the East is a better alternative for America. America, the plum blossoms are falling. Did you notice it? The East is coming up. The East is there. We don't need you because you are atrocious. Look at what's happening in America. Every day somebody goes on trial for murder. And the East is a better alternative because the East is the abode of hope and peace. Represented by the plum blossoms. Unlike the violence of America described explicitly in the next line. Look at the peacefulness of plum blossoms contrasted with the somebody going on trial every day for murder. This indicates that America is undoubtedly in its decline. The East is there, you know. America is in its decline. For months, Ginsburg hasn't kept track of what is happening around him. You know that he is a very political person from what he's speaking, the way he's speaking. You know he cares about what happens around him, but he hasn't read the newspapers for months because the nation is more violent and unjust than he can bear. The daily murders are an indication of the rage and deep unrest in the society. It is so very comparable to many other nations of modern times. I feel like this is a poem about my own nation. Somebody going on trial for murder every day also denotes personal trauma of Ginsburg because at this time many writers of the Beat Generation had been arrested for murder. Burroughs killed his wife. Lucy and Carr was wanted for the murder of David Kammerer and so on and so forth. And Ginsburg also held this as an unfair vendetta of the police. The police are taking revenge. He doesn't read the newspapers because he does not want to know how much more his nation has betrayed him. He doesn't want to know. America, I feel sentimental about the Wobblies. America, I used to be a communist when I was a kid. I'm not sorry. You know? Now he's turning to communism and trade unionism. The Wobblies, or the industrial workers of the world, was an international labor organization, very, very prominent at that time, founded in Chicago in 1905. Inspired by socialism and trade unionism, they had attempted to organize the unskilled workers in the nation. And the Wobblies became very influential on underprivileged groups, like the African Americans, women, and immigrants. The government was, of course, intolerant of them. Uh, the Wobblies appear in Eugene O'Neill's The Hairy Ape. In The Hairy Ape, Yank is uh, awakened to think of his uh, class. He gets an awakening of class consciousness and he's disgusted with the upper class hypocrisies and oppression that is meted out to the working classes. And he tries to go and meet the Wobblies or the IWW, the industrial workers of the world. But there also he feels alienated. That is the Hairy Ape, a 1922 expressionist play by Eugene O'Neill. Finally, Yank gets killed by a gorilla. Coming back to Ginsburg, in childhood, 
Ginsburg was influenced by his mother Naomi's communist views. The 1940s and 50s in America witnessed anti-communist witch hunts. In America and Britain in the 1930s, there was an upsurge of socialism. And in the 1940s and 50s, there were anti-communist witch hunts called the Red Scare, unleashed by Senator Joseph McCarthy under the presidentship of Dwight Eisenhower. The House Committee on Un-American Activities, HUAC, notoriously investigated many writers, actors, directors, including Charlie Chaplin, Langston Hughes, Orson Welles, and Arthur Miller. When Ginsburg says he's not sorry for having been a com communist, it's a highly rebellious and provocative statement that he's making that could have brought criminal charges upon him. I spoke, I smoke marijuana every chance I get. <laughs> not once or twice, but every chance he gets, he smokes it. I sit in my house for days on end and stare at the roses in the closet. The speaker's cheeky confessions are beginning. He says he smokes marijuana compulsively, goes to Chinatown, reads Marx. All these are very provocative things that he's doing, illegal in those days. And when he makes these cheeky confessions, the speaker is ripping off the pretensions of genteel Americans. America is a wonderful, polite place. <laughs> That is a myth. He's unapologetically confessing to actions that were considered immoral, illegal, and antisocial. When Ginsburg is exercising, what Ginsburg is exercising here is a very important demand of intellectuals and activists of the 1950s and 60s America, free speech. It also formed an important tenet of the counterculture movements movements of the 1960s and 70s. After this poem was written, the counterculture movements also demanded free speech. I sit in my house for days on end, means what? He's idle, unproductive, disillusioned, overcome by ennui, perhaps drugged. Because he talked about marijuana just before that. But from the way he talks, we realize that he's also restless and desperate at such inactivity. He wants to do something about the mess around him. Roses in the closet, what, is that, what does that mean? Beauty that finds no use or relevance and is withering away. The speaker is aware of beauty and goodness, but is frustrated that the nation has no use for it and is stifling it. So he sits in his house for days on end and stares at the roses in the closet. When I go to Chinatown, I get drunk and never get laid. My mind is made up, there's gonna be trouble. You should have seen me reading Marx. Chinatowns in the big cities of the US were immigrant centers, Ginsburg, probably goes to the nearby San Francisco Chinatown because he's writing in the nearby town of Berkeley. In Chinatowns, there were immigrants, mostly Chinese, but other Asian immigrants also. And Chinatowns stopped these immigrants from mingling with the rest of white America easily. They were all in the Chinatowns and slowly getting acculturated into American culture. Chinatown is the abode of poor immigrants and they were shunned by the polite society. So that is where he's going to get drunk, but surprisingly, he never gets laid. Now, why is that? He doesn't have sex there. Perhaps he's so dejected and politically agitated that he doesn't find it pleasurable anymore. He doesn't choose to have sex. Probably he's so exhausted in life and has become such a failure that he can't even hook up with a prostitute in Chinatown. 
That could also be the meaning. Anyway, he doesn't have it. And there is ambivalence in the cram, the second line. My mind is made up, there's going to be trouble. Either it could mean that he is determined to make trouble, or he is certain that the government will mean trouble for him on account of his illegal activities. My mind is made up, he's not relenting, there's going to be trouble. Sure enough, he's reading Marx and provoking the authorities and the publisher of the book Lawrence Ferlinghetti was slapped with obscenity charges later that year. There was trouble. This is prophetic. <laughs> the next section of the poem, all this is actually the first section. My psychoanalyst thinks I'm perfectly all right, perfectly right. I won't say the Lord's Prayer. I have mystical visions and cosmic vibrations. America, I still haven't told you what you did to Uncle Max after he came over from Russia. My psychoanalyst thinks I'm perfectly right. I won't say the Lord's Prayer. What does that mean? I have mystical visions and cosmic vibrations. Well, it is not that he is out of his mind. If any one of you thought that the speaker is out of his mind, you were wrong. Because the psychoanalyst thinks he's perfectly right. Whatever he is saying is right and he is in his right senses. As he has told us before, he knows what he is doing. Ginsburg has had taken psychological help before this time and had completely turned to poetry and art for therapeutic reasons also. And he says he won't say the Lord's Prayer. He won't say the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer was a very important thing in America, representing re religious rituals, organized religion. Ginsburg says he won't say the Lord's Prayer. He won't repent because what he's saying is right. He doesn't believe God will do anything about man's misdeeds. What is the use of praying? Perhaps organized religion itself is a mistake of mankind. Like war, capitalism, and oppressive government are. Because religion also oppresses. America had been deeply entrenched in Anglicanism and Puritanism in the past. Especially in New England. The, you, you have seen it in the Scarlet Letter. And the problems created by these religions the society had already suffered from. And he knows it. He doesn't want to turn to religion. He will not pray. Instead, he will have mystical visions. Now, his disillusionment with religion may be due to his communist leanings as well. Remember, Marx considered religion as the opiate of the masses. Instead of the church and Lord's Prayer, the speaker's spirituality takes an informal, irrational form. Mysticism and cosmic vibrations. When organized religion actually divides men, the speaker would rather turn to mysticism that gives him a unity with the cosmos, a cosmic sense of being. That is better. Religion divides you. Drugs were explored at this time as related to mystical experience. And this would later become an integral aspect of the counterculture movements of the 1960s. Remember that also. America still haven't, I haven't told you what you did to Uncle Max after he came over from Russia. Max Livergent was Ginsburg's maternal uncle. You know, he underwent hardships after emigrating from Russia to the U.S. Lots of Jews from Russia have come to the U.S. and Canada. Max Livergent was one of them, and he suffered on account of his Jewish background and communist views. See, Ginsburg 
has confessed the horrible things that he has been doing, like smoking marijuana every time he has a chance, etc. And now he's insinuating that America is doing equally bad things or even more horrendous and unspeakable things. You know, he has not even told America the worst of all the things that he has, that it has done. Even without telling America the worst of the things, America looks evil enough. From this point, he turns away from his feelings of frustrations towards what America should do. Yeah. I'm addressing you. He's telling America, I'm addressing you. Are you going to let your emotional life be run by Time magazine? <laughs> it's like a conversation with love with, with a partner again. I am obsessed by Time magazine. Oh, so was he asking himself? Are you? Is this you himself? Because he is obsessed with Time magazine and letting his emotional life be run by it, perhaps. I'm obsessed by Time magazine. I read it every week. Its cover stares at me every time I slink past the corner candy store. I read it in the basement of the Berkeley Public Library. It's always telling me about responsibility. Businessmen are serious. Movie producers are serious. Everybody is serious but me. <laughs> it occurs to me that I am America. I'm talking to myself again. I think the laugh also was part of it. I had to read it. Even though when Ginsberg recited it, he didn't laugh. But I could hear a laugh here. <laughs> Satirical laugh. Look at the detailed analysis. I am addressing you. Are you going to let your emotional life be run by Time magazine? So trying to draw... America's attention to his speech. Hello, listen to me, I'm addressing you. He turns away from the oppression of politics towards the domination of the media on common man, especially the immensely popular Time magazine. You know, at this time, Ginsburg himself appeared a lot in the media. He seemed probably obsessed by it. He used the media but he also severely criticized it. These were times when media propaganda was on the rise. Will America let the Time magazine decide the emotional life of its citizens? You know, the citizens are not free. They are dominated by the media. The media seem to be completely controlling the nation. The media is perhaps not giving enough attention to the emotional protests of people like him. <laughs> and media just merely mind control the people to think what the authorities want them to think. Are you going to let the media mind control you? Are you going to let your emotional life be run by Time magazine? You know, and he says, I am obsessed by Time magazine. It's a very frank statement. Even as he's criticizing Time, he says, I am obsessed by Time magazine. I read it every week. Its cover stares at me every time I slink past the corner candy store. I try not to buy it, but its cover stares at me like ideology possesses you. You know, I read it in the basement of the Berkeley Public Library. Probably he doesn't buy it. He gets it from the public library. But then why is he reading it in the basement? Let us see. What appeared on the cover of the time in those days, even today, captured the attention of the entire world. The time was so popular. It showed the people what to think, the cover. Also, America looked at reality through the lens of the media. America did not see the reality. It saw reality through the lens of the media. What reality actually is often got lost in the mediated images. How can you trust what is given in the magazines? How can you know that it is reality? You know, In a self-deprecating manner, 
the speaker says that, like the nation, he is also controlled by the media, by Time magazine, and it is there in whatever he does, wherever he goes. He's feeling powerless and probably guilty of succumbing to media influence. Hence, he slings past the candy store and reads it in the basement. He's feeling guilty. Or perhaps he finds the bourgeois ideology of the magazine so vulgar that he has to read it secretly without anybody knowing that he's reading it. See, he is also becoming a hypocrite when it comes to getting obsessed by the media. It is always telling me about responsibility. Businessmen are serious. Movie producers are serious. Everybody is serious but me. The media propagate false and hypocritical ideal images of the nation. Everything is serious, ideal, you know. In our nation also. Whatever stupidity the government is doing, the image that is projected is always ideal. All this responsibility and seriousness is bourgeois pretension. What is reality in America is irresponsibility. The mediated false image that America projects of itself had been a contested aspect of American culture before the war itself. In the beginning of the 20th century, the American dream or the projected image of America had become controversial. In the time of the Great Depression, when the inflated image of the American dream fell flat and turned out to be a nightmare. <laughs> so America, don't tell me about responsibility and about seriousness. I can see through it. I know that it is not true. It, is, it has perhaps little to do with the reality of common men like him. People like him are not serious. They just live their life the way they want. He's feeling alienated from mainstream America because this America of businessmen and movie producers is not the real America at all. You can apply the theoretical concept of simulation here. Jean Baudrillard's simulation was deeply rooted in the simulated images of America. America is a hyper-reality and uh, he is aware that what he thinks as America is not the real America. He is suspicious of the concepts of responsibility, seriousness and success. Ginsburg's questioning of American values and his rage against conformity, puritanism and inhibition that marked other poems as well, particularly how led later in the same year to the infamous trial for obscenity that Ginsburg won and opened many doors for future poets. It occurs to me that I am America. <laughs> I am talking to myself again. I am America has many implications. What is real in America is the ordinary people like him. What is real in America is not the businessmen or movie producers. What American corporations and Hollywood project as America is not true. What is real in America is the ordinary people like him, not the people in business and Hollywood who sell an artificial image of the nation. I shouldn't say not the people in business, not the corporates. Being a part of America, the speaker feels responsible for what is happening there, especially since he is aware of how he has become obsessed with the media and with mediated reports of reality. And then he says, I'm talking to myself again. These two lines suggest a neurotic mind. <laughs> it occurs to me that I am America. You know, mad people will think they are something else. And mad people will also talk to themselves. These lines suggest that he has a neurotic mind. And if he is the same as America, it would mean that America is mad. 
Talking to America is like talking to himself. In his passivity and conformity, he's also to blame for what is wrong with the nation. This is the next section. I will talk about this section in another video.